I'd like to call the uh, regular meeting of the City Council of April 15th to order. Uh, hi, would you like to lead us in the Yes, I would. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call. Council Member Hawkins. Here. Plummer. Here. Such. Here. Williams. Here. Mayor Garavent. Here. Um, city Administrator Miller is here. Deputy City Attorney Ruby Goldstein is here. Uh, acting City Engineer. That's here. Your, wake up, Jerry. <laughs> Fire Chief. Here. Police Chief. Here. Administrative Services Director. Here. And Community Development Director. Here. Well, everyone's present and accounted for, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, item B is City Clerk's Report on the agenda posting. At 1.30 on the 12th of April, uh, the agenda was posted for public view. Okay. Item C is approval agenda. Is there any additions, corrections, subtractions? Seeing none. Seeing none, we will move on to presentations. Number one is Gerard Ficello. Oh, and it's spelled incorrectly on the agenda. Oh, yeah. Sorry <laughs> about that, Jerry. <laughs> it's, it's Gerard, not Gerald. Pachillo, a city engineer for 40 years of service. Now, I'm looking over a copy of the meeting minutes of April 16th, 1979. And um, uh, long, agenda, long agenda, actually, long, a whole bunch of Three items. Two, What's that? Well, I, wasn't gonna go, I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> but... Um, uh, Council Member Leslie and uh, made the motion, and uh, Ronnie Stern made the uh, second uh, to employ J GJF Engineering to do city service the engineering city. Uh, sorry, to do the city engineering services on a retainer basis of three hundred dollars a month. Is that what we're still paying you, Jerry? A little bit more. Oh, okay. <laughs> Effective April sixteenth, nineteen seventy nine. Um, uh, subject to acceptance by JG, uh, GJF Engineering, which I obviously did. And we want to have a plaque here and want to um, give to you for your 40 years of service as a city engineer for the city of Sonora. Came out in 82, 
and then some of the businesses would, <clears throat> would park in front of their, their business, and they would get, uh, was it Pop uh, <coughs> Hudson? Hudson. Mm -hmm. And they would get a note from Pop Hudson, we got park here. So uh, we would always have these complaints that, oh, we need more parking, we need more parking. So I think it was in 82, we, uh, we actually formed a, a, a parking and business improvement area so that you can, you can build uh, parking uh, facilities and, and then assess the businesses for them. And one of the first jobs was that uh, the, the, one of the double-deck post office parking lot, that's the parking lot there at uh, Shepherd Stewart at Lyon Street. Uh, they wanted to do it. So we, we did a, a like preliminary design of it and everything. And, and uh, we came up with a, with a cost, and it was like, oh, the 50 spaces, it was a, a half a million dollars and everything. So we brought that to the meeting, and uh, after that, we didn't have a parking problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you bet. All right. Good. Good. Okay, um, pr presentations item number two is introductions of uh, training service volunteer and explorers. I'm going to go to Chief, or is it going to be Sergeant? Sergeant Wirtz. Thank you very much, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. My name is Tim Wirtz. I'm a sergeant with your police department. I work for this wonderful man, Drew Vanderbilt. And uh, today we're going to present our explorer group. Uh, there is no action required on this item. Um, the background on our on our Explorer post is we're Explorer Post 364. Um, and we accept explorers throughout the year, and when they achieve a, a six-month area in their, we'll call it a career with us, um, then, they, then they get to be actually badge members of the Explorer post. Um, we have six of them, um, and I'll just call them out one by one. Um, but we'll start with a community service uh, volunteer who was an explorer for us, Kirk Bryant, if you can come in here. <laughs> so Kirk Bryant joined, joined the Explorers in October 2017. He initially joined the Explorer Post to learn how he could assist motorists who had been involved in motor vehicle accidents throughout our area. As Kirk continued with his learning, the duties of the explorers, he began to realize there was more to the program that he enjoyed and wanted to follow in his brother's footsteps. His brother was a, a explorer of the year in 2013, and Kurt just recently aged out of our explorer program, which is 21, um, and now he wants to be a volunteer for us, which we really appreciate. Our volunteers do a lot of work for us, and I hope he looks forward to working a lot for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I would like to, to, to bring Kurt on with us, and today is his badge pinning ceremony, so I really appreciate it. And we have new advisors in our, our Explorer post, Ashley Brandau, Officer Ashley Brandau, and Thomas Brickley are helping us out in our Explorer and CSV program, um, and they'll be doing a great job for us, I, I'm sure. Uh, back here so we can get a picture. Uh, the next one is Catherine Campbell. <laughs> Catherine Campbell is a student at Columbia College and has set her goals in herself to earn a bachelor's degree in criminal justice eventually. In her junior and senior years of high school at Somerville High School, Catherine participated in the school's law enforcement class, which introduced her to the Explorer program. Catherine joined the Explorer program to gain experience in the police service and work with the community. She feels she has gained experience and confidence to become a police officer in the near future. After college, she looks forward to continuing with the North Police Explorer program. Very good. Notice on our badge.
badges that we're pinning them today. Um, it's kind of a uh, respect to a fallen officer that uh, it was a CHP officer sergeant uh, down in Southern California that got killed by a drunk driver. So that's why the, the blue, blue line. Next one will be Haley Camp. <coughs> Haley joined the Sonora Police Department Explorer Program to learn what it's like to be a police officer. She wants to push herself to be stronger mentally and physically and wants to become a police officer in the future. Haley prides herself in being honest and always doing the right thing. Haley sees herself being a strong police officer, helping others and giving back to her community. One of the goals is to show people that an officer is much more than a man or a woman with a gun. It is someone who can help and someone who will truly do the right thing, even when no one is looking. She wants to be a explorer because she is truly devoted to becoming a police officer. Thank you very much. Our explorer program has, has grown quite 
quite a bit, uh, especially recently. Um, so we, we really appreciate all the work they do. We have 10 explorers now, um, and they do a lot of work for us. <coughs> and the CSVs also, so thank you. of the city. No action may be taken. Matters to be addressed may be referred to city staff or placed on a subsequent meeting agenda. Speakers are limited to a five-minute presentation. Is there anyone that would like to speak for um, public comment? Seeing no one, we will go to item F, which is consent calendar. Items on the consent calendar are considered routine and will be voted on in one motion unless a council member or member of the public has a question or wishes to discuss an item. In that case, the item will be removed from the uh, consent calendar and considered separately. And the items on the consent calendar are the uh, one, the me following meeting minutes, the City Council study session meeting of April 1st, the City Council open session meeting of uh, May, uh, April 1st, to the approval uh, to pay ordinance uh, invoices of previously budgeted expenses on April 16th, 2019. And item three is approval of disbursements in the amount of $135,546.90 uh, on April 12th, 2019 for payroll inclusive of, of employee salaries, employer and employee taxes and retirement contributions and miscellaneous voluntary employment employee deductions. Are there, is there any items that uh, council members want to pull? Go ahead. Um, I, I would like to pull the minutes. Please. Of which which minutes? Oh, I'm sorry, the um, open session of April 1st. Okay. And that was the same thing I was going okay. to do. Okay, okay. Is there any other, well, pull that item. Is there any other items we pull? Uh, open up for public discussion on the remainder of the uh, uh, consent agenda. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council for a vote, or for a motion, rather. So moved. So, council member Williams moved on the remainder of the, uh, the uh, consent calendar, minus item 1A, 1B, rather, 1B. Um, and council member second, is there uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, who was the motion and the second? Yeah, uh, the, second. The, the motion was by council member Williams and the second was by council member Plummer. Did I miss that? I guess I missed that. Okay, brought it back to the uh, council for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, motion passes. Then we'll go back to the uh, item 1A, or rather 1B of the uh, uh, open session meeting minutes of April 1st. Uh, speak first. Connie. Um, and on page 4, it the council member by consensus, there were four things listed, and I'm wondering if number five should have been included, which would be to remove one parking space south of City Hall, um, south of the City Hall crosswalk on the east side of Washington Street. I think we all agreed to that as well. Out in front of the EDA, the former EDA. We were just going to do that. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, it, there's a process because it's state highway, but we can make note of that. I, I, it wasn't 
it wasn't directly relevant to the project, so it wasn't a, I mean, it was talked about, but it wasn't one of the four items for the Red Church project. Okay. So do you want it in there or not in there? I would like it in there. Okay, sure. All right. Sure. Um, and Connie, is that your only? That's it. Okay, Claire, did you have something? Um, <clears throat> yes, on page three, Sharon Maravich's comments. She also there's, she also spoke about um, that Caltrans has staff that specialize in historic districts. I don't know that. I mean, I, I guess so. So these are not verbatim minutes. We well, I like I would like that recorded in the minutes. So I thought that was a really important point. I'll be happy to go watch it again and tell you oh, what I, she said. I just got I just got the recording. We could look at it. So what is it that you'd like to add? It, she said that she just suggested that in these kinds of projects that that we also involve um, Caltrans staff that's, who specialize in historic districts, and I think that would be really helpful for us and would help us not proceed along. Um, in a way that we maybe don't want to, that we later choose not to. So, um, I, I think she said it was in di District 10 has, which is our district, has right. one, yes. as I remember. But that's all I remember. Yeah, they normally get engaged through the environmental review process, and they, and they are engaged in the transit project in terms of the um, aesthetics of some of the things that are being proposed. The difference is the environmental review was done in advance of Caltrans being involved in this project. So it just would be helpful, I okay. think. To we'll, we'll add that reference. Sure. Yeah. Is there any other looking inside? No? Um, I, I just have one. This is actually a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, we didn't make a motion. Was that intentional? Yes. It's not a motion. It was not a motion. It was just a consensus. Because it was, it was for discussion and direction, not action. But they, it was originally an action item, was it not? No, it was listed for discussion and direction. Okay, all right. That's it. Okay. Seeing no further amendments, I will entertain a motion on the new minutes. As move amended. To, move to approve. Second. Okay, so moved, moved by uh, Mayor Potem Hawkins and seconded by Councilmember um, Williams to uh, approve the meeting minutes as corrected or amended, rather. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes, <coughs> passes unanimously. And that was Hawkins and Williams. Yes. Okay. Item G is unfinished business, there is none. Item H is public hearings, and there are none. Item I is new business. Item one is presentation by Lisa Mayo, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Tuolumne County Visitors Bureau on the 2019-2020 uh, preliminary budget and marketing plan. Lisa. Thank you, good evening, and thank you for having us here tonight. So our, uh, what we want to do tonight is go through our two-year budget that you have in front of you. And just see if you have any questions, and we'll give some highlights. I have Jen Lopez, who's our marketing manager with us tonight, as well as Katie Kirkland, our communications and stores manager. And I'm going to let them talk about their parts of the budget. Um, but a couple things I just wanted to touch on. We have a, um, a line item called partnership co-ops, and I just wanted to explain what that was. And that's when we have um, something that we do, like we take out a section of the San Francisco Chronicle, and we put money out towards it, and it's pay to play, so partners, some of our members, um, or other partners in the community would pay that, um, would pay that portion of it. So that's just reflecting that in the budget. And then with TOT, you might see that we kept it fairly flat. Um, we are obviously not through this year yet, so we're not really sure what to compare to. Um, to gauge that, but we feel that we're being conservative, and we'd rather be um, conservative than, um, than over budget, what we feel will come in on the TOT side. Um, we are in the county, um, at the county we are expecting a significant income in a couple of years, probably a year and a half to two years worth of some new properties that are coming online, um, and so you'll see that reflected in there as well. 
Um, and on the expense side, I also wanted to let you know what is included under payroll. It includes salaries, wages, medical benefits, bookkeeping services, payroll, taxes, and workers' comp. And we have a larger than normal increase from 2019, 2020 to 2020, 2021 um, to allow for the current uh, part-time uh, position that we have to hopefully go full-time. And also, um, we have to keep up with the minimum wage increases. And, um, so that's something that we're looking at, too, as we budget ahead. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring Jen up to talk about um, some of the items, the highlights of the marketing, and then at the end, we, we can do questions. Good evening. Thank you. So just really quickly to talk about the marketing portion of the budget, I'll just give a quick overview of um, what it now uh, entails. Um, pretty much the marketing portion is print advertising and publications such as uh, the, in the newspaper takeovers that Lisa just mentioned. It's internet advertising, social media, uh, television and radio advertising and programming, uh, leisure, travel uh, shows, and also um, our, our annual vacation planner and website, just to, to give a brief overview of that. I'll just quickly give uh, highlights of the upcoming uh, marketing plan budget. So this year and in the upcoming years, we're really going to be putting an emphasis on sustainability and sustainable and responsible visitation and travel to Tuolumne County. This is becoming increasingly important as we are getting more and more visitors. And it's it's uh, what we would like to do is include all of our partners and members of the community in this as much as they would like to to um, highlight some of the, their own sustainable practices as well. But also, we would like to further develop our Tuolumne County Too Cool to Trash campaign, which we kicked off in January when we were handing out trash bags at the Yosemite entrance gate to um, visitors going into Yosemite during the government shutdown. So that's part of that as well. And also, Visit California, essentially the Visitors Bureau for the State of California, is rolling out their own sustainability program this year, and we look forward to utilizing some of their tools to help us in, in our own in our own efforts as well. Um, I'll also talk a little bit more about um, something else with Visit California is that we are finding that when we do advertise on visitcalifornia.com, their website, or we sponsor their e-newsletters that they send out to their to their uh, databases, that we really see a very good um, return on those advertisements. And when we do have those have those campaigns engaged, we're seeing a significant increase in vacation planner requests and people signing up for our own e-newsletters. So it's very very beneficial, and we also. VisitCalifornia.com is second in the referrals to our website um, after Facebook being first. And also, um, with Visit California, just one more thing is that as we are in a limelight more and more with them, is that we're they come to us more often to ask us if we would like to host familiarization tours, which I think he's going to talk about here in just a minute, but um, and other opportunities to, to partner with them, which just it gives us uh, more leverage on our investment with them. Um, the next that I will highlight, the next design item is video or digital content creation and um, specifically video development. Um, I was at a tourism tech summit just three weeks ago, and with all of these conferences and, and shows that we go to, we it's, video is always emphasized on it's just going to become more and more important, especially in our industry. According to Think, think with Google, 66% of people view videos when they're planning a trip. And we, on, when we're putting our videos on social media, we're seeing very good engagement with those as, as well. And video is really great because it's, it's this tool that it can encompass a lot of senses all in one, one place. It, it, see and you hear and, and you, it, we can um, show excited people and so it's, it's a really a really great tool to use that we'll be leveraging more and more. And then finally, uh, research, uh, just for a moment. Um, we did have an, a line item for our budget this current year to do research, which is a significant cost. 
However, with um, the light of tourism recovery after the fires, those funds were shifted um, to be utilized at other places um, for our recovery efforts. And so we do have that back in our budget for, um, for later in the future. So now I'll turn it over to Katie and we'll take questions after. Yes. Hang on, let's just see if there's any questions for you okay. specifically. Is there any questions for Jennifer? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. So to highlight the public relations section of the budget, which is working with media to develop relationships and get them familiar with Tuolumne County by arranging and coordinating media trips. It's super important for the media to get a first-hand experience at Tuolumne County. It just adds some credibility and um, value to their publications. So as you can see, there's a notable increase in the public relations budget. This is to allow us to continue to work with international and domestic media, including Black Diamond, which is the PR and travel trade company that represents us in the UK. Um, it also allows us to work with international media. It's super important that um, working with international media because international mm -hmm. guests stay longer in a destination and spend more money in the destination. Um, and then we've also increased our presence with Visit California, as Jen has said, and so they have really been um, inviting us to be part of familiarization tours. Um, we have one coming up, actually, it's a Gold Rush fam, so they'll, we'll be getting to see groups of media in town and spending some time in downtown as well. Um, our media focus will include social campaigns to target millennials and perennials, which is a millennial parent, a term, a new term we learned about, a new market. Um, we learned about them at the 2019 uh, Visit California Outlook Forum. And then top tier media and group media tours like the Black Diamond UK fam tour that we had this past September where the group um, visited for four days and then two good days in downtown Sonora with overnight stays. Um, the next next section I would like to highlight is the travel trade section. Um, this includes working with travel agents and tour operators, airline representatives to develop partnerships and increase group travel to Tuolumne County. So the increase in the travel trade portion of the budget um, is increased uh, We've added an increase to in partnerships with advertising with tra travel trade companies, uh, familiarization tours to train travel agents, just like the fam, the French fam that we had. It was a group of 24 travel agents from France, from France, <laughs> who came to um, Tuolumne County for a day, and they spent the, the whole afternoon in downtown Sonora and did an overnight stay and dinner. So I don't know if any of you saw them running around town speaking French. It's pretty cool. Um, and then also that kind of doesn't fall under the travel trade budget, but it's incorporated with travel trade. We're planning a film familiarization tour as well. So we'll be inviting um, film agencies and producers to come to the area to get familiar with it in the filming locations too. So um, travel trade will focus on international travel markets and then also meeting planners focusing on regional opportunities and um, an emphasis on highlighting unique meeting spaces and midweek and off-peak travel. So any questions on those sections? Any questions for Katie? So, <coughs> so the um, <coughs> uh, fan tour for the film, has that been set yet? <coughs> We're looking for uh, during fall time. So it's off-peak, but then the colors and everything are really really gorgeous, so it'll give them a nice overview of what Tuolumne County is like. Any other questions? Thank you. I'm going to pass it back to Lisa to wrap it up. Okay. Are there any questions for me? Yes. <coughs> so, during that time frame that you've had somebody that's been reaching out to the film, what are you experiencing? Is there interest? There is interest in filming. Um, I think it's a lot more challenging environment than it used to be because um, while we have wonderful authentic locations, so much can be done digitally. So I think that that's kind of an egg that we have to crack. 
Um, with our film liaison, she is attending um, film liaisons in California statewide meetings, and they have workshops, things like that, so that she can learn more, network more. Um, we do get every now and again from the California Film Commission, we'll have somebody come across asking for a specific um, look or feel, and we always answer anything that we feel is even close to what they're looking for. Um, we do find out sometimes after the fact that they, things have filmed, and they kind of go under the radar, which is unfortunate because there should be filming permits being, being uh, taken out, which helps us to know exactly what's going on. But I do feel like we, we will have some more things. I know um, uh, Bethany has worked with some, a couple large um, movies that actually they ended up going elsewhere, but she made some good contacts, so I think that's what can develop. But the budget has an increase for film. Is there a reason for that? There's nothing, there's not really any, it, the things that we have budgeted are like they, we're in the key um, creative handbook for the industry. Um, the, I mean, the things that we're doing are, are basically what we can do. There's, you know, the fam, the fam tour is something different that we have not done, at least not since um, in the last seven years or so. Um, I don't know if there was, I think there was one in the past way back. Um, but I think that's something that could be effective and effective use of the funding. For sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, I just a couple things. Once. One, I just want to say that I reviewed this budget and I marked it up with all kinds of questions and then I turned the page and read your, <laughs> you answered almost all of my questions. So that was actually sort of, that was lovely. Um, I just have a question about Black Diamond and I know that you pulled your return on, your research on return on investment last year because of the fire. But um, I understand that international tour, Tourists perhaps stay longer and spend more money, but has that really brought in more that a significant number of international tourists? Um, so this last year was the first year that we had Black Diamond, and um, our investment with them is forty-five thousand dollars. And um, the I can't remember if you might have some of the full return on investment uh, dollars last, this last year, just in the media side of it but it was like something like $300,000 um, that we received in media. Now, as far as uh, like, like journalists writing about it over there, like we were in Cosmopolitan Magazine UK. I mean, there's some really great um, pieces that we were in. Um, so really we have to do a, a survey with um, the hotels to see, you know, is our UK travel sector, is that, is that rising? Is it, um, you know, greater than it has been. So, because people don't come in to the visit, we want everybody to visit to come to the visitor center, um, but they just don't do that. Um, but we we feel that this is something that I always say three years when you're investing in something to, to let it go for three years to see um, the return. So I, I think we have yet to see it, but um, Jen does regular surveys with our members too, and um, that's one of the questions that she does. Uh, just a comment like I had last year was, you know, I, I've had people that live in my home state of Virginia and they're, hey, is this, this is where you live, right? You know, so the marketing is, is working. Um, you know, of course, a lot of people are going to see it and not as many are going to come, but the word's out there. So, good job. Thank you. Anyone else? I have one more question. So, um... When I look at this back page, mm -hmm. it states that the TOT tax for the city is $496,000. But I don't see that when I look at the budget. Why this, is that? Well, because our budget is on a fiscal year and this is for the year. So that, I believe, is where the difference would be. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, just. So we had one peak year that was about that amount on a, on a fiscal basis. <clears throat> um, our TOT is generally um, something over $400,000. I certainly hope that you guys, 
that we were able to pay you what you projected in your 2019, 20, and 2021 budgets because that would mean the city's TOT would be 540,000 and 600,000, which are amounts that we've not reached before. But if you can bring more people in and generate those kind of amounts, then we all share what you know the, the return on all that. So, <clears throat> but um, that does it, that is higher than our highest year to date. By some, by some considerable amount. Which is so, a perfect, so is a perfect segue to my question. Yeah. Uh, it's almost embarrassing to put on a bean counter hat when I believe that you are doing a great job and, and I'd love for you to tell us the return on investment is way of furnishing the, furnishing the, you know, so there's another report you're going to get um, in August after the end of their fiscal year. That's generally where they summarize what their accomplishments are. Cool. So this is what this is what it's going to cost and what they're going to do, and then you're going to hear later what they did do and and what it what the accomplishments were. My question now, and, and it might be you, Mr. Miller, who is a better source for this. The projections are optimistic, and as I understand it. We just pay a percentage of what actually comes in. That's correct. And so we're not, on, I mean, the city won't be on the hook if, in fact, these are overly optimistic. Okay, thank you. It makes it easy to support. Okay, is there any other questions or discussions? Thanks so much, Lisa thank and you. Chad and Katie for coming and showing us. Oh, uh, even though it's a presentation, I will ask for um, public comment. If anyone wanted to comment on this item? Seeing none, I will. Thank you very much. And move on to item two of new business, which is consideration to introduce and waive the first reading of Ordinance 835, repealing and replacing Chapter 8.12.010 to 8.12.090 regarding defensible space. So uh, before the chief gives her presentation, we're not going to ask you to take action this evening. Um, and the reason for that is the um, enforcement and penalty provisions of this ordinance tied back to your Title I okay. um, that you just went through today. So when, when we bring that back and have that set for introduction, uh, which likely will be your next meeting, then we'll bring this back because it can all tie together. But uh, this ordinance can't go into effect until that those provisions are enacted. So they need to run parallel. So we, but, so, but we do want to have a, we do want to present it tonight. Okay. So this comments. is an introduction, and I'm going to say that we go to the first reading. Or, um, is it, or is it just? We'll just uh, take it as a discussion item. Okay. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council members, members of the public. <laughs> um, so you know, this has been long in, in the making back a few times to the Council of Defensible Space. I've gone out and talked to the constituents. Um, they had questions regarding it. And the first thing that I wanted to point out is the city does currently have an ordinance on file, and that is the one that I've been trying to repeal in the place, which is 8.2.010 through 8.12090. That ordinance uh, was written back in 1985. And um, to date, uh, talking with the, the city administrator and staff, there was never really in any enforcement, and it's more restrictive for the residents of the city of Sonora than the government code section, which is actually state law and in effect. So as you know, when the city council looks at things to um, pass that are uh, more restrictive than state law, they can do that. They just can't pass something less restrictive. So we already have something on the books that's more restrictive, but it's not practical. Um, the ordinance reads now that if you have any land in the city that you have to mow everything and cut everything down to four inches. It doesn't say anything defining shrubbery, things like water, landscaping, or anything. Um, it also covers um, whether it's a small parcel, large parcel, it doesn't matter. So it's really hard to ask those homeowners in the city if they have a large parcel, 50, 20, 100 acres, to go out and mow everything down to four inches. Um, it hasn't been regularly enforced in the city, and they have 15 days to, to um, after notification of an inspection, to complete 
the work. If they don't, then the current ordinance says that the city will come in and do the work for them. And if they do not pay the cost of doing that, then there'll be a lien on the property. Um, I've talked with the city administrator and staff, and that's not the, uh, the work of the fire department. That, and what we want the city to go into is putting liens on people's property. We want to educate them, um, let them know what tools are available out there to help uh, prepare their house, prepare their, uh, their lots uh, for defensible space in case we have a wildfire. So that's just a little history of the background of what our current ordinance <coughs> is, um, which is more restrictive than state law. Um, now, the ordinance that I prepared for you today is actually based on the government code section uh, 4291, which is our defensible space in the state of California, our uh, public resource code, I'm sorry, 4291 and government code section 51175 through 51189. That is actually only adopted through the California Fire Code. It's a section in the Fire Code. So when you adopted the Fire Code, you automatically adopt that section for the principal space. But we have a more restrictive ordinance that is what we would have to fall under. So I'd like to repeal the current ordinance and replace it with this government code section, um, which is state law. It's less restrictive, but actually goes into more detail of what the principal space actually is. That zero to 30 feet right around a homeowner's um, house or dwelling structure, whatever they have on the property, and then 30 to 100 feet or to the property line, uh, cleaning up, limbing up, um, putting spacing between the fuels so that there's not ladder fuels to direct a fire and increase the intensity of the fire to someone's house. The only addition that I made to the ordinance for restriction is that the government code section and public resource code does not cover vacant lots. And we do have a significant number of vacant lots in the city. So after going out and talking with some constituents that either had large parcels or vacant lots, um, what I am proposing, and I want to make sure I'm in the correct area, actually happened <coughs> in the discussion as well. But if you look at the second paragraph in the discussion, what it would do is it defines that 30 feet to 100, um, or excuse me, 0 to 30, the 30 to 100, and then also provide a 10-foot reduced fuel zone around the perim perimeter of a property line that borders a building, structure, dwelling, or egress area. So if someone has a 100-acre parcel, it's not saying to go around the entire uh, property line. It's saying if there is someone's house, some type of structure or dwelling, or it's an egress route for someone to get out, that they would put a fuel reduction zone in that area. So that is more restrictive than the resource code and the government section code, but looking at the fires that we've had, uh, especially the, you know, God forbid, if something happened like a campfire in, in paradise, that egress is extremely important. Not only does this protect the property owner that is providing that fuel, um, shaded fuel break area, uh, because if there is a fire, a structure fire in that house dwelling on the other side of the property. This gives them a little bit of a buffer zone as well and a safe area for firefighters to come and work so it doesn't spread to their vacant lot or their, um, their large parcel before it gets to their house. So, um, so what I've done is when you read through the defensible space, I go through definitions first to, um, and this is right out of the um, Public Resource Code and Government Section Code, those definitions, it defines everything for, for someone so they can understand what's the difference between defensible space, which is that 0 to 30, and the reduced <coughs> fuel zone, because those are two separate things, so it, it identifies that for people. And then it also um, goes into the requirements a little bit more in depth. So in 8.12012 on page 4, the requirements of defensible space, what does that exactly entail? So it has those items listed out so people can understand what it means to limb up the tree when they're um, from the base, what it means to remove all the fuels, um, the spacing that's required. Uh, also, you know, lets people know that if you have uh, live vegetation, that doesn't have to be removed. If you have anything on landscaping or watering that's alive, you don't have to remove that. So it just goes into a little bit more detail for everyone to explain it. Um, if, we don't, if we didn't put that in the ordinance, then we would just reference the government code section and the public resource code, and we have to provide that anyway. We've made up pamphlets for that um, for the public that, they, um, that we've been utilizing so far. But 
Um, like I said, the only addition to this is going to be that section of either a vacant lot or, or a parcel that has a, a house, a structure, or a dwelling adjacent to it or an egress route, that they would have to provide that area. So it's not for their whole, their whole um, parcel or a vacant lot. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Okay, any questions for Chief here at this point? One. Yes. On page five. Yep. Item number five. Cut dead or dying grass to a maximum of two inches. Yeah, so what this is, is um, we want to remove the dead fuel, but we don't think that you'd have, you know, using a, a weed whacker that usually takes it down to about two inches, we don't expect someone to come in and scrape it down to bare soil. So if you do have that dead and dying grass, that would be reducing it down so that if a fire is coming through, it's not going to go anywhere in two inch stubble. It's going to snake around a little bit, but it's not going to have a lot of fuel coming through. So my concern is uh, they do it when the grass is dead and dying and start a fire. Is there a time frame where they shouldn't cut? Uh, well, you know, what we tell people is you shouldn't be mowing dead grass with a lawnmower. That's not what it's intended for. So if you're on a riding lawnmower, a regular push lawnmower, or self-propelled, it's not meant to cut dry grass. Um, they're out trying to do the right thing, just with the wrong tool. So when the, the grass does dry out, you can start when it's green, but we all know if you cut it when it's green, it's still gonna grow back, and we don't wanna create twice as much work for someone. So when the tops of the grass start to turn brown, uh, using a, a, a weed eater that has the Teflon or nylon string, that's the safest way to go out and make sure that your defensible space is good because it's not going to spark when it hits a rock or anything like that. Um, it is a little bit more labor intensive, but that's the proper tools that you need to cut the grass that's dead on the property. Do we specify that somewhere in the literature that we give to the homeowner? In the education materials, we do, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any questions? I would, just, <clears throat> I would just like to say that, yeah, I think you've done a great job of, of addressing our concerns for our special needs, and I think it's a great document. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. And then the only thing the city administrator did touch on is on page six on the back, the violations. Um, we're trying to get everything more in line with what's going on in the city. So uh, the review that you're having in your open study sessions is, is the title one. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want the city to have 15 different things for violations or corrections. Um, so <coughs> once that gets passed, it would fall underneath that ordinance as well. Okay. okay. Any other questions for Chief New? See none. Uh, public comment. Anyone like to speak on this item? Seeing no one, I'll bring it back. And uh, do we need to continue this item, or do it's going to be re no, agendized? No, re agendized. Okay. okay. Item number three is consideration to adopt resolution number 04-15-2019-A, adopting a list of projects for fiscal year 2019-2020, funded by uh, Senate Bill 1, the Road and Repair Accountability Act of 2017. So we've, we, uh, the assistant, <laughs> the administrative services director um, has helped me with this um, staff report, but it includes the resolution that we're asking you to adopt this evening that would, uh, designate our available funds for this year uh, to be dedicated to storm drain improvement projects, which are eligible activities um, under the SB1 um, program. The, um, we, are, we, we expect to receive about 77,000 this fiscal year and 81,000 next fiscal year. Um, <coughs> so our plan would also be to go back and reappropriate uh, the current year's funding, which was designated for overlay, it's also for storm drain improvements. Um, those estimated costs uh, are in the order of two to three hundred thousand um, dollars. With the road funds, don't have enough money to to undertake those repairs. I did share with some of the council uh, 
um, earlier that we did receive, the county has received um, a disaster declaration from the governor, and the governor has also requested that the uh, president uh, make a similar declaration. We were added into a, a long list of counties that were part of a designation in February, and there was eight additional counties that were added um, as of the 12th of the month. So, and that information's in your in your uh, mail downstairs. I don't, at this point, I don't know what all that means yet. I don't know what money we're gonna get. Um, generally, with funds that are available from the state, there's still a 25% match on the local agency part. If there's a, a FEMA disaster declaration and funding, then that drops down to something less than 10%. But, but that that isn't a given and hasn't happened yet. And, and then there's the whole process of inspection and, and um, proving that, there, uh, that the work was needed because of the storm drain damage, it's not repairs that were needed because of improper maintenance. So there's, there's a whole process to go through before we're gonna uh, receive any money from the state or the feds. So, so the prudent thing I think to do is what we're asking you to do is, and that is to designate our current year's allocation for, for those repairs. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Uh, the council may have. I have one. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Miller, what mm -hmm. other sources do we get dollars to help with the repair of roads? Uh, we get um, highways user tax funds, which were some of the original um, gas tax measures. Those numbers are something around $100,000. Part of that goes to support the um, the um, the maintenance costs, the personnel costs associated with our public works department. So it leaves little for for road repair work. So, but the, the exact numbers I don't have. I mean, I'd have to look them up in the budget. But um, so unless unless and until we get um, <coughs> state funding, we'll use the available. Uh, street money that we have, and we're proposing to use uh, the SB1 funds that we have to try and cover those costs that were incurred because of the storm damage. So to the extent we've got to um, use other funds in the budget, we'll come back to you for a budget amendment. Is there a possibility that if, if we do find other funding through the uh, from the state of the federal that some of this money can be backed out oh, yeah. back to street yeah, repairs? Yeah, we can go okay. back in to our account and reprogram the use of the funds. Okay, yeah, I'm concerned about that part of it. No, we, that's what we would do. I mean, to the extent that we get reimbursed for those expenses. Okay. Any more questions for? With the, the storm drains, we're talking about in here from the, uh, the all the damage that was done. What's What's the estimated cost? So the estimate uh, based on the field review uh, between the city engineer and the state OES representative for the Sunrise Hills work uh, was on the order of magnitude of about $200,000. Um, I haven't seen the, the, the bill yet for the main drain work, but I'm guessing it's um, somewhere between twenty five and 50000 or more. Um, that work is now complete. The, the area was, has just been repaved. Um, and we're, I should have by this Wednesday uh, so, uh, at least one, if not two, proposals for the Sunrise Hills work. So I'll have a more, more exact uh, price at that point. But we're still working on the initial estimates. If the drains are not fixed, and I'm, I'm getting to a point on this, if the drains are not fixed, how much more damage will happen to various roads due to that? Well, in that case, it's an outfall line that runs uh, along the backside of commercially developed property, and the part of that bank's already washed away. Uh, it discharges into a creek, so there would be a sediment in the creek, and that would be a water quality violation that the city would be dealing with. Okay. Any other? And if you look, if you've had the opportunity to look at it, it's gone. Yeah, and the pipe's missing. Yeah. yeah. So it went downstream, I guess. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's busted up in pieces down the slope. But, yeah. um, well, my my biggest thing for asking these questions, um, it's all some things out there. Just that the taxpayers, our constituents, understand that we're being biased with the money. 
and essentially stopping what could happen later on. So that's that's my there there be more issues down the road. If we huge do. issues. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Yet? I just have a quick one. Um, is the street overlay project paving or striping or both or neither? Um, so <laughs> it's it's a pavement overlay that would include striping as the finish whatever was needed. We still have um, our first year's allocation of um, something less than $30,000 that we're gonna be using either with our own crews to do some center line pavement uh, striping work. Yeah, for as much as that will cover, which isn't a lot, but, but we'll deal with the safety, some of the safety issues from uh, for the striping needs and some of the other pavement marking needs. Okay, if there's no further questions for Mr. Miller, I'll open it up to public comment. Does anyone like to speak on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the council for more discussion or a motion. Well, I'll make a motion. Excuse me. Um, I'll make a motion. <coughs> that the city is required to adopt to receive the city's fiscal year 2020 SB1 funding allocation. Second. Okay, so moved by Councilmember Boyan, second by Councilmember Plummer to adopt resolution uh, 04-15-2019A. Any further discussion? I'll call for the question. I'll say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, passes unanimously. All right, item J are monthly reports. We've received the monthly staff reports from the Community Development Department, Fire Department, Police Department, and Public Works Department. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, I'll go to the item K, the Vision Sonora Committee Report, which there is none. Item L, Communications Business License Activity for the third quarter of fiscal year 2019. Any comment on that? I'm still asking for uh, We didn't do it this time. But we will. Well, I would like to. Uh, I think it's important that the council know if these are new businesses or re new or business licenses. <coughs> I see one that definitely is renewed on the list. Or, or a new owner, even. Okay. Anyway. Any further discussion? Any, any other comment? Any other comment? Chris is listening this time. Okay, Chris. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to item M, which is council member and department head reports. And we'll start with uh, council. Well, actually, we'll start the back. The uh, administrative services director, Mr. Gorski, any report? No, thank you. No. Fire chief New, is there any report? No. Can you serve, uh, I did, almost did it again. Community development director, Ms. Kellogg. I just have to quick. Keep trying to make you head of a county agency. I know. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I did want to let you know that we have continued work out of the Dragoon Gulch Trail for those of you. I don't know if you walk it, but if you do, uh, we are now working up on the Summit um, Trail, and we're doing, again, some fire suppression activities. Um, baseline has been out there, um, and they will be out there off and on for the next couple weeks. Um, then they'll be moving out of here because by then they'll be able to get up in the high country and stuff. But we did do a lot of activities to um, do some suppression out of the trail. So I'm going to let you guys know that. Good. Yay. Okay. Police Chief, Mr. Ben Wheel. Yes. I'd like to make mention that uh, this week, April 14th through 20th, is National Public Safety Telecommunications Week. What that means is uh, time set aside to recognize our local police dispatchers. Um, so, you know, for they are the link between the community and fire and ambulance and, and uh, police as well, law enforcement, and do an incredible job for us. Um, our department alone, we receive over 2,400 911 calls per year on average. Um, and if you look at your monthly reports, you see how many per month. We regularly stay well above 2,000 just, just calls, mm -hmm. just regular calls for service. So, um, with that, uh, we are going to recognize them on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Uh, with an ice cream social, and we we have 
some uh, uh, gifts for them uh, to present. And so I would invite you all, uh, as well as city staff and uh, those who left here in the community, <laughs> can come by. We can't let uh, all the public behind the, uh, the, uh, the doors would become the, count, uh, the counter. And thank the dispatcher for doing such a wonderful job and telling the chief that, that uh, you get some ice cream too. Uh, then you can have a, have a scoop as well, uh, as long as supplies last. So come by and help us celebrate our dispatchers. Is this at the police station? I'm sorry, yes. Down the police department, yes. I have another question for the chief. I noticed that you've added something to your, your report, collision incidents. Is there a reason for that? Yes, I, I thought that was an important number to uh, just at least be aware of, because uh, the number that we've been reporting is actually the uh, collision investigations uh, that we take, so the actual reports. Um, but there are many collisions that, are, that happen that we don't not take an investigation report on. And many times, um, people get in a collision, there's no injury, there's no one's drunk, everyone's licensed, and the parties just would rather choose to exchange information. And that's just for your knowledge to see how many actually happen in the city, um, because I don't think the, the uh, investigations tell the true story. Okay. City engineer, do you have any? Uh, so, well, one thing I, I didn't mention, uh, 40 years ago, in the early 80s, the meetings used to start at 8 p.m. and go to 11. Oh, okay. Uh, and they usually went to 11. They had a cutoff at 11. And the city clerk, city clerk Paul Vaughn, used to take half the council down to Savannah's. Yeah, yeah. I bet. That's why they quit a lot of time. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, they had <coughs> And they already had dinner before they started at 8 o'clock. Okay, city administrator. Um, nothing this evening, thank you. Councilor. Nothing to make. Uh, Councilor Member Williams. Okay, um, let's see. I attended the American Legion post-58 celebration last Thursday night, which many of us were there. A great celebration for a great reason. Um, I am going to attend the uh, Riga City's Legislative Action Day. I have to be in the Sacramento the next day, so I'm going to participate in the Action Day. That's all. Mm -hmm. yes. Colette? Um, just a couple of yes executive committee part executive committees and yes partnership meetings. Um, I attended the fire safe um, fire safety program that the county put on it, and I attended the one at the college on Saturday. Learned some a few things. Um, I also attended the American Legion Post Fifty Eight dinner uh, on the eleventh. Um, I also have a question, and I don't know if this is where I'm supposed to say, ask this, but um, in, at the last meeting, Sharon Maravich also mentioned um, the Mills Act and asked if the city could consider um, participating in that. Is that something that we've considered and decided not to participate in? The county does, but uh, yeah, I, don't, tax I, don't, breaks. I don't know the history on that. Of, of the Mills Act? Uh, uh, no, I know what the Mills Act oh. is. I don't know what the city history is considering it. Could, could we look into considering it? We can... I mean, it, could, it can offer tax breaks to uh, city mm -hmm. businesses with, with historic buildings. Historic historic buildings. And I think that we could, this downtown needs some help, I think, right now. So, that's it. Mayor Bertal, Hawkins. Um, I guess a couple things. One, I need to publicly thank the police department. Um, had a rabid skunk on the property, and um, don't discharge a firearm in the city, first of all. Call the police department so it can be documented, and um, they put the poor little thing out of its misery. So that was, I mean, it's sad, but it's, it's reality we live in. So thank you to the police department, Chief. Um, 40 years ago, Jerry, my mother was throwing up, 
so I'll leave it at that, because I keep teasing you about it. It's really an honor to uh, work with you. You and I have got to sit down a lot and um, you know just go over things. And quite frankly, there's a lot in this city that your hands have touched, that you have went through and explained the history. And you know when I've had some issues of you know explaining or whatever, you, you've always been there. So I really appreciate that. So that's um, that's all I got. No, nothing. Nothing. Brevity is the soul of wit. Brevity is that's that's an interesting uh, interesting analogy uh, that you weren't even born. Uh, I, I was getting close. I was uh, close. Uh, the Bee Gees were playing. Okay. Um, just want to say, uh, attended the um, my phone's not working, so attended the TCTC meeting. Uh, on Wednesday, and uh, also attended the Post 58 Smith Bolter's 100th uh, centennial uh, celebration of, of the Post and of the American Legion on uh, last Wednesday. It was a really nice event. Uh, and we have members in the audience. We have the commander in the audience, and we also have a, a member of the uh, our own police chief is a member of the uh, uh, board of directors. Is that fair to say, or an officer anyway of uh, of, of the uh, of the post. Member at large. Member at large, okay. All right. As I've been told, just got told by the commander's wife, he's also in the audience. Um, and I believe that is it. And we will see you next time. No, oh, no, closed session downstairs. Oh. Okay. Item in is adjourned into closed session. I forgot about those after. Um, is conference with legal counsel to anticipate litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to government code section 54956-9 uh, E3. Uh, one claim. Is there any public comment on the uh, closed session item? Seeing none, we will adjourn in the closed session and we will reconvene. Um, will we, come up? we won't come up here. We'll, the agenda is to reconvene downstairs. We'll reconvene downstairs downstairs if anyone's interested in staying. And there we are. Uh, so you usually have it's usually yeah. 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 for the dispatchers. What is that? Huh? We only got one more. Yeah. But it's a